So page 15 of the Matthew's Gospels. We're reading from chapter 6, verse 7. Jesus said, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Well, thank you, Katie, very much indeed for reading, and may I add my welcome to Wes's. It's very good to see you here, and this is very much part two, uh, following on from last week as we're looking at the central part of the Sermon on the Mount and authentic spirituality. So if you weren't able to be with us last week, do at some stage in the next few days, if you're able, uh, download the first part of this series. Our subject this afternoon is spirituality and prayer. And we're going to see that there is a Father in heaven who hears, there is a King enthroned who rules, and there is a God who is real, who provides. We're looking at spirituality over these few weeks in the city, and prayer is, of course, foundational to any form of spirituality. And and last week, we noted just how popular spirituality is in today's city, whether it's the eightfold path or the 12-step program, whether it's the teaching of Marcus Aurelius or crystals or meditation or one or another form of cleansing pilgrimage. In 2017, to have as part of your core values on your CV some power greater than myself from which I draw strength remains highly acceptable. What better place to go for instruction on spirituality then than Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? It is Jesus, after all, who gives us the golden rule in the Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus who instructs us, do not judge in the Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus who tells us to love our enemies, to turn the other cheek, to do good to those who hate us in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount who gives us One of the greatest exercises enabling us not to be anxious, de-stress. We'll come to that. And right at the heart of this block of material, Jesus' most famous sermon, is the Lord's Prayer. First then, there is a Father in heaven who hears. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Having warned his disciples to watch their audience with great care and to guard against hypocrisy, mere eye-catching, applause-seeking spirituality, Jesus now teaches us how to pray. And the opening four words would have caused an audible intake of breath. The word Father in the original is the word Abba, And you will know, much to the frustration of many mothers, it's the first word, baba, that a small baby learns. I know of a city businessman who claims his child's first words were golf club, but I'm afraid I simply don't believe him. The word baba or abba is the first word of the uh, the young child, not quite as familiar, though, as daddy, more familiar than father. And so says Jesus, true prayer is to be relational, not ritualistic. Friendship, not formula. A living, active, experiential affair, not dead religious rote. And that is captured, isn't it, in verse 7 and 8, and the contrast between verse 7 and 8 and the beginning of verse 9. When you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the nations do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. 
Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. The Lord Jesus, as God the Son, addressed God the Creator as my Father. That was radical. But the Lord Jesus, as God the Son, tells us in fulfillment of the new covenant promises from the Old Testament that we are to address God the Father in the same terms, and that is revolutionary. And of course it flows out of the very heart of the Christian gospel. There is proper gospel, confident assurance to Christian prayer. We don't tiptoe into God's presence lacking certainty like a second class courtier, unclear whether we will be received or not. He chose us in eternity, he called us in history, he sent his son to die for us at Calvary. He loves us, he's redeemed us, he's brought us out of the grip of rebellion against God our creator and into friendship with God our creator. He's washed us clean, he loves you, he sent his son to die for you. And he's clothed us in the perfection of the Lord Jesus. And therefore, as a highly favored, forgiven, adopted child, indwelt by God himself, the Christian disciple is encouraged to come and do something unique and to address the creator of the universe as father. Confident assurance. Relational intimacy in Christian prayer. We come to God as our father. He knows us inside out. At the end of verse 8 there, don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. He knows you inside out. He loves to hear you request. He loves the relationship and everyone who calls on him finds that he is near to those who call on him, to those who call in faith. As the saying goes, God is just a prayer away. And so we can come directly into his presence, knowing that he loves us, that he wants the best for us, that he cares for us, and that he's glad to hear from us. There's an intimacy to it. We're not sort of uttering prayers to some impersonal force, Father. And then there's an immediacy to our prayer. When we pray, we're not firing arrows, hopefully, into the air. We're actually speaking to the creator of the universe, our Father in heaven. But notice that we pray our Father in heaven, and that I think preserves Christian prayer from a slushy, inappropriate sentimentalism. Not quite as informal as Daddy, less formal than Father, in that kind of formal sense that somebody might use it today. Abba, in heaven. Now, all of this makes Christian prayer, as I've suggested, and as Jesus suggests in verses 7 and 8, unlike any other prayer that you will find in the world. When you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles or as the nations do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. There's an attempt to kind of twist the arm of, an un, of a reluctant deity. Pray rather, Father. And so the Hindu prays mantra-like, seeking to twist the arm of the million gods. The Buddhist prays spinning his or her prayer wheel, which is almost a form of lucky charm, hoping they might come up trumps. The Muslim prays to God out of a sense of duty, salat, five times a day, I must do it to earn my place in heaven. That is not Christian prayer. It's precisely what Jesus speaks against in verses 7 and 8. Don't heap up many words. And the unclear, inadequately taught Christian praise, hoping that somehow they might wrangle or wangle something out of a distant deity. And some spiritual people follow a program, a set of steps, an ascending path, the mind is emptied, the world is escaped and the senses are subdued. That is not Christian prayer. 
True Christian prayer is full of bold confidence, relational intimacy, and personal immediacy. Our Father in heaven. May I say I've been a Christian for 37 years now? And as Wes suggested at the start, this I find to be the greatest privilege and wonder of the Christian faith. That in the privacy and quiet of your own room, you can shut the door in your heart and draw near to the creator of the universe knowing that he loves you. And you talk to any Christian here today, any real Christian, and they will say that is the greatest privilege of the Christian faith. It's beautiful, isn't it? And isn't it far superior, if, if I might use that word, far preferable to a kind of disembodied spirituality or an attempt to twist the arm of a reluctant deity? God's just not like that. There is a Father in heaven who hears. Notice secondly, I'm afraid only secondly, I hope we're going to make it, but here we are on verse 10 and the end of verse 9. I mean, we could have a whole week on each one of these headings, couldn't we? That there is a king enthroned who rules. Look at the next three lines. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And do you notice immediately the first three requests of the Lord's Prayer all have to do with God and his agenda rather than me and mine. And this turns our normal human priorities on their heads. It's his name that is to be hallowed. It's his kingdom that should come. It's his will that is to be done. And immediately you can see that Christian prayer is not first and foremost about me getting my way. So much so-called spirituality is simply a kind of uh, pious way of discuss talking about what I want. This is completely upside down, isn't it? Christian prayer is not seeking us seeking to manipulate God to line him up with our agenda. Christian prayer is us coming to God in humility and being lined up with him. The word to hallow is literally to make separate, to set apart, to consecrate. Hallowed be your name. God's name speaks of his purity, his goodness, his justice, his truth, his otherness. And true Christian prayer therefore begins with a radical change of priority. And when you stop and think about it, and this is to recap on last week, any so-called spirituality that is really just me seeking to achieve my ends or enhance my aims is a rather lightly cloaked hypocrisy. I'm making it sound really pious, but at the end of the day, it's just me trying to get my way. And so Christian prayer begins with repentance and faith, coming to God on his terms, him setting the agenda. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come is on a similar theme. There are at least two time frames in mind, I think, and at least two groups of people in sight. It's a prayer for the kingly rule of Jesus to be advanced right now in history, in the period we're living in. May your kingdom come. We know that it would be glorious if people bowed the knee to Jesus. It would be life-enhancing as they came to know God as Father. It would be wonderful for the city if people started to follow the Lord Jesus with the radical change of life and priority that that would bring. And so, Lord, may your kingdom come. Just think how good it would be for your business if everybody followed the Lord Jesus with everything that he uh, requests and seeks. And so please bring it. But at the same time, it's a prayer for the return of Jesus and the start of his new creation. Come, Lord Jesus, is the great prayer of every Christian longing for the Lord Jesus to bring his new creation. 
So two time frames and also two groups of people. I take it both the Christian and the person who is not yet Christian are in sight. It's an evangelistic prayer. May your kingdom rule advance in my office, in our family, in the place where you've put me. But at the same time, it's a prayer in my own life that I would increasingly come under the practical rule of King Jesus. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And your will be done is a desire that in every act and decision in my life, it is his will, not mine, that prevails. Remember, Jesus play, prayed that so, uh, uh, so clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane. My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as you will. Now, once again, can you see how radically different these prayers are as they're focused on God and on his agenda? Not my name, not my honor, not my reputation and my career. Hallowed be your name. Not my power, my influence, my rule, my desire. Your kingdom come. And not my will, my plans, my strategies, what I consider to be best for me, but your will be done. And so at the heart of the kingdom of God, yes, is a relationship with God in which God is recognized as God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Contrast the phony piety, the hypocrisy of the Pharisee against which the Lord's Prayer is pitted. Oh, the, when the Pharisee gives, whose honor does he seek? We looked at this last week. Verse 2, thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. You know, when the big corporation gives and demands that its logo be stamped all over the product, whose honor are they seeking? their own, pure hypocrisy. And when the Pharisee prays, whose influence is he seeking to advance? Verse 5, when you pray, you mustn't be like the hypocrite. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. So whose influence are they seeking? Not thy kingdom come, but may my kingdom advance. And when the Pharisee fasts, whose will is he concerned for? He disfigures his face to be seen by others. And so Jesus asks us to consider the agenda of our spirituality. It's gloriously pro positive, our Father in heaven. It's life-enhancing May your kingdom come, your will be done, your name be honored. But whose agenda lies at the center of our spirituality? Ours or God's? And true Christian prayer begins with repentance and faith. There's a king enthroned who rules. And in this broad, broader context, and only in this broader context, we're urged then to pray for and about ourselves. But again, if you look at verses 11 through to verse uh, 13, it's extraordinary what Jesus considers to be our greatest priority. You know, if we'd begun with a rather uh, unfair exercise, and I'd started and said, look, we're going to have a moment's silence, and we're all, I'm going to ask everybody to write down what they think to be their greatest need today. Yeah, we'd all come in and we'd written down our greatest need. I wonder what you would have put on the list. Jesus has three things here. First, provision. Second, pardon. Third, protection. Verse 11, provision. Give us today our daily bread. Even that isn't as simple as we might think. So if you look at, you haven't got a footnote there, but in most translations, of the little, most, uh, most Bible copies, there's a footnote at the bottom. There is here, certainly in my Bible. And it says that from the footnote, when we pray, give us today our daily bread, it literally reads, give us today the, our bread for tomorrow. 
And in the first century, of course, in a subsistence culture, you worked today for the food that came to you tomorrow. So, yes, it is a request for our daily provision, that we might be able to pay the mortgage, that we might be able to pay the rent, that we might be able to get enough food or whatever. But it would be altogether wrong to see this prayer as limited simply to my physical needs. For the request that God should give us today, the bread we need for tomorrow, is a direct reflection of God's people in their wilderness wanderings, where on a daily basis God rained down manna from heaven so that they could make it to the promised land. And so the request that God give us today our bread for tomorrow is asking that God will give us not only our physical needs so that we can pay the mortgage and the down payments or whatever it happens to be, but also that he will give us what we need spiritually day by day by day by day. And it does speak of a daily dependence that each day I begin the day on my knees asking God to give me everything necessary spiritually so that I can walk with him. I wonder if you do that. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So this is a prayer that I and my family be equipped day by day with everything we need on our journey through life. But it's not a prayer necessarily that God will give me the girlfriend I want or the promotion that I'm seeking or the job offer or the pay rise or the 36-inch flat screen color TV that I covet. No, it's a request that God will give me everything necessary to walk closely with him until the point of death when I will en enter his presence forever. Guide me. O oh, thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. Pardon. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Once again, isn't it interesting what Jesus considers to be my greatest need? Forgiveness. And isn't it interesting it includes that as we have forgiven our debtors? And once again, I think that is pitted against the Pharisees and hypocritical spirituality. Because hypocritical spirituality puffs itself up. Look how good I am and how well I'm doing as I strut my stuff, saying my prayers in public and exhibiting my spirituality. And hypocritical spirituality looks down its nose at everybody else. Look at that riffraff. But rather, if I'm in genuine relationship with the living God and I pray to him, Father in heaven, I will realize how spiritually impoverished I am. Have mercy on me, Lord. And as I realize that I need mercy, I will be very slow to look down on my next door neighbor. And so forgive me my debts as we forgive the sins of others. And I'm sure that's what we find, verse 14 and 15, which puzzle, puzzle us so often. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. In other words, if you've learned that you need forgiveness, then it will issue in genuine forgiveness of others. <laughs> and as it issues in genuine forgiveness of others, then you will exhibit yourself as being authentically Christian in relationship with the Father. The person who is poor in spirit who mourns his or her own sin, who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, is the person who is quick to forgive others because they know they need forgiveness themselves. And finally, verse 13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Here is a request that we should not be led into testing that is too difficult to endure, and here is a request that God will protect us from the greatest enemy of all, Satan. A very senior Christian was asked once, why do we speak so rarely on spiritual warfare? Because we don't believe it, was his reply. Well, Jesus does, and Jesus considers right at the heart of our daily need protection from the evil one, 
and that God in his goodness would not lead us into temptation beyond anything we can bear. Well, here then is the Lord's Prayer. At the heart of the kingdom of God, a living relationship, not dull ritual or ritualistic rote. We've seen the phony righteousness of those who approach God on the basis of their own works exposed. There is a sort of, not all spirituality is good, says Jesus. Much popular spirituality is simply hypocrisy, says Jesus. And we've seen the phony piety of those who seek to show off. But at the heart of authentic prayer and the kind of prayer that God hears and loves is this living relationship as forgiven children come to him on the basis of his agenda, his authority, his rule and pray our Father in heaven. I want to encourage you to do that and we're going to do that right now as we pray using the words of the Lord's Prayer there in the Bible in chapter 6 and verse 9 and I thought we would all pray together and then may I encourage you over lunch to talk with somebody else about how you might put this into practice without falling into the trap of the Pharisee and uh, parading it on the street corner. So let's pray together, shall we? And when we get to deliver us from evil, we will just say amen. And let's take it nice and slowly so that we can engage in intimacy with immediacy with our Father in heaven. Together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.